doing today? Good, okay, great. Uh, this is, whoops. So my name is Michael. Um, I founded a company in 2013 called Kit. And in 2016, the company was acquired by Shopify. The main reason why I'm here today uh, is not to tell you about the virtual employee that we built, but really to kind of talk about how staying lean uh, really actually got us to a position of being acquired. And in 2010, I was one of the top 50 Audi car salesmen in the country. Uh, so Paul, you didn't realize you're going to spend a shit ton of money today to hear a car sales and tell you about how he made it. But this is a little bit about my story. And in 2016, I've spent the last six years uh, trying to become an entrepreneur. And I think it's kind of a, a journey that is forever. I don't think it ever has kind of a closing point. Even when after you sell your business, you're, you're constantly learning. The, the, the number one thing that I get from people when they find out that we sold a company that was only three years old is they wonder how we actually sold a business after three years. But the reality of it is, is that building a company takes a tremendous amount of time. And my story and the journey uh, prelude the, the beginning of Kit. And in 2008, uh, standing on a car lot, I decided that I wanted to try to build a technology company. And so me and a couple of buddies... Ooh. Me and a couple, what, does it do that? Me and a couple friends decided to uh, build a photo sharing website that did not do very well. Uh, but I essentially caught the bug and realized that building technology was one of the greatest experiences that I had ever had at that point in my life, and that I wanted to continue to go on and do something. The important thing about failing uh, is that you actually don't fail, that you learn. And the number one lesson that I learned at that point was that I was the wrong entrepreneur to be building a photo sharing website. I really did not know shit about photo sharing. I did not know anything about artists. I did not know anything uh, that could add any value to the artistic community and their needs. And so I decided to build a company that helped small business owners. When I was seven years old, I started working in family businesses. And I worked in family businesses until the point I was 25. I actually sold cars for my father at a dealership that he ran. And I thought that I could apply the knowledge that I had gained over that 15 year period to help small business owners find more success. And so I quit my job and I became a technical recruiter and I convinced a mobile app developer to build me a mobile iOS app to basically turn the traditional punch card into a loyalty card that powered a CRM service. And my wife was kind enough to let us max our credit cards out and sell our car. Uh, I couldn't get anyone to invest in us so I did what any normal person would do and I put up a rally.org page and asked my friends and family to donate to fund my, uh, my venture. And after maxing out the cards and getting about $2,000 in funding, uh, I decided to quit the recruiting job and to go at it full time. And so me and my buddy would be working every night and every weekend, and at this point I was working every single day, to build this little mobile loyalty app company. And we worked out of this living room uh, for about six months. And uh, my wife got to a point where she was embarrassed of having people come over because it started to kind of look like an insane asylum with all uh, the, the notes and the post-its all over the walls. But we did everything that we could to build exposure, right? We, we had zero experience, we had zero money. I lived on the top floor of an apartment building in North Beach here in San Francisco. And so we got these 15 foot long billboards uh, that we painted giving.com on and we hung them off the side of our house because we thought it was gonna give us a ton of exposure. This picture was actually taken the morning of Fleet Week. Uh, so we thought, Blue Angels are in town, everyone's gonna be standing on their roof. Uh, we can't really afford Facebook ads, but maybe this will help us get some eyeballs and drive some installs. Eventually things continued to progress and I got a little office space at Rocket Space, which is a uh, co-working technology campus here in San Francisco. And this was a critical point in our company's history because it really exposed me to the fact that I wasn't standing on my own island. Every single person was trying to build something great. Every single person thought that they were building a great company. And the reality of it is, is that there's only so much space at the top of the mountain, right? And so being in a room constantly around other entrepreneurs forced us to work harder, forced us to be even more disciplined about the decision making that we are uh, putting forth with our company and our process. And things were progressing. Uh, we had, at that point, 600 businesses on our platform. We had 20 universities on our platform. We are revenue generating. At this point, I've been turned down by about 30 different investors, but we just kept trugging along. And the painful reality was we didn't realize that we were dying a very slow death and that we were not building a big business. 
And I think the most painful lesson for an entrepreneur is that regardless if you have a lot of capital or you have no capital or you have a big team or you have a tiny team, it doesn't really make a difference because you're all competing with one, with one another. But the one thing that's important is that you have to be moving fast. And we were moving incredibly slow. And by the time that we realized that we weren't going to make it, there was about 500 mobile uh, loyalty app companies in the ecosystem. No one wanted to invest at that point because the market was saturated. And we had to have a very painful conversation about our future. Like I had invested you know, all of my money at this point. I had borrowed money from my family at this point. I was 27 years old. I had no college degree. I had quit my job. I had no real life work experience. And um, I had to dig very deep. And I had to ask myself, what did I learn along the way at this point? And was it worth continuing on the journey? And from this, we decided to build the company Kit. And the idea with Kit was, we were going to build a CRM service that wasn't powered by a mobile loyalty app, but that was powered by your Facebook page and your Twitter engagement and your Instagram engagement. And so we moved along. And this time, we started taking some of those, those early learnings that we had from giving. And we moved very fast. And we worked very hard. And we quickly scaled up to 4,000 businesses this time on the platform. And then we had the new problem, which is that building technology for small business owners is very broad. Right? There's small business owners that are focused on retail. There's small business owners that are coffee shops. There's small business owners that are service-focused businesses. And so now we had a new painful lesson where we knew we were passionate about small business. We knew we were passionate about technology. But we absolutely had no idea what we were building for. And so then we defined a new customer. And we said, well, what if we focused on people who were selling on Shopify? These are retail-focused businesses. They're small business owners. And so we went forward with that, and we launched the Shopify integration in November of 2014. But then we face a whole new problem. And that is, we had spent all this time. We raised a little bit of money at this point. We had you know, bullshit our way through the process. We convinced Facebook to give us ads API access. We convinced Twitter to give us ads API access. We thought we were this innovative, brilliant company that was helping small business owners because we got the ability to build a Facebook advertisement down to three steps. And I don't know if any of you have ever used Power Editor before, but it's like the worst experience imaginable building a Facebook ad. And if you're a small business owner, it's virtually unbearable. And so we thought we were some great company, but really we weren't shit. And the problem was, was that we were simply an improvement business. Our technology was only as good as the next person's technology that was going to take it from three steps to two steps. And again, I was at the, fa the, 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 the desperate reality that I was about to now fail my third business in a row. I was virtually living on food stamps. My wife, who had a degree in pre-med, was waiting tables to pay our server bills. And we had this crazy idea and this tough realization that we were solving the wrong problem, that software was actually not the issue. The issue that small business owners face is that labor is a humongous problem. None of them could afford to hire help. I remember talking to one customer that forever changed the course of our business, and he was telling me, he would rather do his taxes than run an ad on Facebook. And I thought, wow, that's pretty terrible. But why don't you just hire an agency to run your ads then for you? And he said, I just don't have enough money to pay for somebody to do it. And so we started asking every customer we had this question, why are you not hiring someone to do your marketing? And they all said the same thing. And so we thought, could we build an employee that they could hire for $10 per month that would do all their marketing for them? This was in July of 2014. And so we said, this is basically like our last ditch effort, right? Like, we have to make this work. The problem is, we had no money at this point. We were running very, 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 very low. And so the beautiful thing about being lean and when your back is against the wall is that you're forced to innovate. Like, you're forced to ask yourself these very challenging, tough questions. And we thought, how can we build a person with no money? We can't build an iOS app that doesn't fix the problems. They don't know how to use the software. And so my grandmother sent me a text message on my walk home one fateful day. And I realized that if my grandmother can text message me, probably every single person on the planet can text message. And we asked ourselves, could we build something that you could text message back and forth with that would run your advertisements for you? And so we went on to build Kit. I'm sure everyone's familiar with the bot revolution that's going on right now. We've been kind of labeled as the first to do it. Like, there was no bot title. It was Kit CRM pushes customer management forward by going back to the basics. It was the first SMS product that hit the market in January of 2015. No one had ever seen anything like it before. 
And I remember very vividly trying it for the very first time. And the way I kind of correlated is that when you're in the studio and you're making a song, I've asked myself a million times, do you think that when Pharrell was making Happy, he knew he had a hit? Like, we used it and we knew we had a hit. It was very clear that this was going to change a lot of shit. And we have eventually moved out of Rocket Space the following month. We secured more funding. And we got a 200 square foot office in the back of a law firm with no conference room. And we stacked six people in this 200 square feet. No bathroom, no kitchen, no ping pong table. And we grinded. We worked 80, 90, 100 hours a week. We kept pushing. And then we integrated Instagram ads. And that blew up. Kit could run an Instagram ad with one text message response. We then moved even bigger into 800 square feet. Again, one unisex bathroom, no kitchen, no ping pong tables, no lunch room, because we didn't care about those things. What we cared about was being innovative. What we cared about was being successful. And we filled this office with the biggest group of mishaps you've ever seen in your life. None of us had any technical background. Some of them were intern students from San Francisco State, the college I dropped out of. I convinced these people to drop out of school. Our first employee on hire, she quit her job at Ghirardelli Square. We paid her $12 an hour to work for us. And we continued to push through. As things were starting to explode, we realized we still only had one engineer. But yet, our demand for Kit was going through the roof. At this point, we were at 30 countries around the world. Right? People were using us every single day. And we realized, well, they're going to want more than just Facebook ads. They're going to want more than just email marketing. They're going to want more than just Instagram ads. And so January, we launched an API that allowed for other developers to build skill sets that Kit could use. And Kit could actually go and use their marketing apps. Right? Still, there's no bot industry yet. I'm going out and fundraising, and people are telling me that no one wants to invest in messaging. No one wants to invest in a robot to do your marketing. That it was not going to work. But we kept persevering. We kept pushing forward. Facebook announced this as their most innovative partner of the year in 2015. They started going around the world and speaking at various summits, telling us that we were the solution for small business owners. Because what was critical is when we solved our own problem, we realized that we started solving lots of people's problems. Facebook wanted small business owners to buy ads. Buying ads was too difficult. And we got it down to three text message response on Facebook ads and one text message response to Instagram ads. And so we kept pushing. And we kept pushing. And then finally, out of the blue almost, our number one partner uh, made an offer we couldn't refuse. And we were acquired in April of 2016 by Shopify. Now, even though we were acquired, we were determined to stay lean, right? Because at this point, I think I figured out the blueprint, right? We did so much with so little. Now, what do you do when you're in a publicly traded company and resources are endless? They gave us complete autonomy over the business. We asked, we refused the ping pong table. We refused all the glorious things that come along with being there. And we kept pushing. We kept staying focused. We built onto uh, Facebook's messaging platform. We were one of the first people to build onto that which allowed us to now scale up to 100 countries in the world are using Kit every single, businesses in 100 countries are using Kit every single day. We then moved into an 8,000 square foot office and we set a simple reminder on our 42 foot wall that we're not here for second place. We're a team of 20 people now and uh, we're very adamant that we're going to build the best team in the world. Part of like why I wanted to come here today was because I want to talk about how we continue to go big. I don't know how many people here are in the process of building a business or thinking about building a business. But for me, this has been an eight-year journey. And these are some of the most valuable lessons I lived in that eight-year period. One is failure is a fantastic filter, right? The one thing that I loved along the way is the people that I've met. And the scary reality is, is that 99% of people quit because it's so hard. So like, ultimately, the same challenges that you face, they're facing. And the ones that have the strong mental perseverance to keep going, those are the ones that are going to keep standing. And so you need those challenges. You need people to get weeded out. But the reality of it is, is that if your heart is not in the right place, you will quit. Right? If you think that you're going to build a technology company, and you're going to get rich, and it's a get rich scheme, it just never pays off. I made that mistake. With giving, I thought, I'm just going to make decisions to sell my company. And I failed miserably. It wasn't until I focused on building a publicly traded company and not depending on other people that I actually start finding real success. 
And I did it because when I wanted to quit, I couldn't bring myself to quit. Because it felt like I wasn't quitting my company, but I was quitting on myself, right? The reality of it is, is that you have to live with the results. And I think that there's a lot of hype in Silicon Valley about being peer pressured into how you should be spending your money or what things you should be caring about and how you should be moving. But the reality of it is, is that I was turned down by every single mainstream investor in Silicon Valley. Not a single one. I was actually turned down 50 plus times. Some of them I went and tried to pitch multiple times. And I love these guys. I'm friends with a lot of them now. Half of them emailed me congratulating me when we got acquired. And I understand why they turned me down. I've matured in my way of thinking and understanding that I failed them in not presenting the right story. It wasn't their fault they said no. It was my fault that they said no. And so I'm thankful for the lessons that they provided me. Point being is, if I had stopped at any single one of these no's, I wouldn't be standing here today. My company would not have got acquired. We would not be in 100 countries. We wouldn't have tens of thousands of businesses that depend on us. We wouldn't be Facebook's largest marketing partner for small businesses. It's very easy to quit. It's very easy to be influenced by someone else telling you you can't do it. So you have to invest in the right things. You have to invest in people. I did not take a paycheck for three years so that I can pay for every single person on my team. That was my priority, not me being a founder, getting paid, but building the best team that at the end of the day was going to make sure that I got paid. This is the truth. I never had a single TechCrunch article until the day they announced our acquisition. I never sent a single dollar in PR, and I never bought a fucking t-shirt for my company. Right? You buy t-shirts and sweaters on IPO day. You don't buy t-shirts and sweaters when you're four people. Every person I know that has bought in t-shirts and sweaters, their company has busted. I'm convinced that it's, <laughs> that it's like a faux pas thing to do. Lastly, is that you have to stay lean, you have to stay humble, and you have to go big. There is no point in building a small business. You have to reach so far outside your comfort zone, and you have to push yourself to the outer limits of what you think you're capable of doing in order to go big. And that's really all I have to say today about how my journey has translated from peanuts to continuing to try to make it in this world. But thank you very much for your time. Hopefully this was of value to some of you. And I'm happy to answer any questions if there's time for any questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very so much. So we have time for a Q&A. If you're close to the microphone. <laughs> If you're close to the microphone, you can step up. If you have a loud voice, you can do it that way. Or I have a microphone for people, too. So raise, anyone who has a question, raise no. your hand. Yes? Uh, can you tell me about the, the shift in the purchase point where it went from mobile to Yeah. What was that plot that you did? So the question was, what was the transition point between going from mobile to texting? And I really, really, really wish I could take more credit for this answer. I wish I can give you some brilliant, uh, we had so much foresight into what the world would look like and conversational interfaces would be the future. The reality of it is was that we just didn't have an iOS developer at that point anymore and we had no money. And so we believed that you needed to be talking to Kit. We didn't see web interface as an option. We didn't see mobile web interface as an option. I didn't really want to go hire a contractor and we spent three months trying to figure it out. It really was a text message from my grandmother that I went home and I got in the shower and I was thinking about, wow, that's really cool. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was like, wow, that was really cool. My grandma sent me a text message. And then I remember when I first joined Twitter back in 2008, which I still, believe it or not, do all my tweeting by SMS. Uh, you can text message Twitter for, at the phone number 404-44 uh, and you can receive tweets, right? Or uh, issue out tweets, dispatch tweets. And so I remember jumping out of the shower and just scribbling down ideas and my wife was like, what's going on? And I said, I actually think that you're going to be able to text message with Kit. And uh, I sketched out what I thought that the interface would look like. And I went back and I showed my co-founder, Mike, who we've been working together for eight years. I said, we need to start collecting phone numbers from our customers. And he was like, dude, we just built in Shopify. Why are we connect collecting phone numbers from our customers? I showed it to him. And he was like, OK, that will work. Uh, and we built it as a prototype. And I remember you know, our numbers were so dismal in November of 2014. Uh, even on the prototype. And then by January of 2015, it like 200 x uh, And I was like, holy shit, we're completely shifting our business to focusing just on SMS. It was the best month we had ever had. 
and it was the best decision we ever made. Next question. Yes. Uh, so my question is, you said you had a team of 20 people now? Yep. And as you went along, how did you make sure that the culture you were instilling in your company would, would stay the same or maybe even you wanted it to move? So how did you, what were your tricks to keeping that culture? So, so that's the best question and that's something that I spend all my time now thinking about, right? Is like how at 20 people do you keep the same culture as that you had at two people? And that's why we have a 42 foot wall that has five foot letters on it that says not here for second place. Um, the hardest thing about when you get acquired is that a lot of people do financially well. And I didn't want them to think that just because we got acquired we're going on to a resort lifestyle, right? And the reality of it is, is that the DNA of the business is spread amongst your team. And if you can have influence over your team and helping them understand how special the moment in time is. So for us, this is going to sound incredibly crazy, and I hope I'm not judged here, but this is what I tell my team. In the 80s, there's obviously the Macintosh team. Not just Apple, but the Macintosh team. And that team forever changed the way that people wanted a personal computer in their home, right? Google forever changed the way that we looked up answers. Very few of you are going back to an encyclopedia, right? Facebook changed the way we're connected. Like, there's companies that, in very mo like particular moments of time, change the way that we actually use technology and the way that we embrace technology. In the 70s, computing was a hobbyist geek thing to do. The timing for Apple was right. The timing for Google was right. The timing for Facebook was right. It's so critically important for my team to understand that we are ahead of everyone else by a very far stretch. But we can also be that type of a company that when we look back 20 years from now, we ushered in a whole new era of interface and technology for everyone else to be a part of. And that sometimes legacy is greater than currency. This is one of those times that when you come and work at Kit, I can adamantly say that your legacy will outweigh your currency. And so everyone has to have this sense of urgency and understand that we are in a once in a lifetime situation right now. Right? We are building the future of virtual labor. There's no other company doing that, right? And not the way that we are at least. And so when you have these discussions with people, specifically as you interview them, you have to be adamantly honest with them that if they're okay with just collecting a paycheck to please go to Yahoo. Right? There's lots of companies that will pay you very good money, but it's over and done with. Right? Like that, that era has moved on. Like we're at the inception point of something that's going to be very special for a very long time, and there's certain requirements and expectations about people that are a part of that journey. And if they don't want to sign on, you understand, but you should outline it for them up front, otherwise they're going to be miserable along the way. And I think that you know, people buy into that. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? So that's a great question. So his question was, how do we maintain our lean methodologies now that we're a part of a bigger company like Shopify, which is 2,000 people? Um, well, first and foremost, we're very fortunate that Shopify's headquarters is 3,000 miles away. Um, <laughs> so they allow us to run our own office, and everyone that works in San Francisco is focused on Kit. So first and foremost, we kind of feel like we're still just 20 people. We don't really feel like we're a part of a 2,000-person team. Uh, the second thing is, is that we have complete autonomy over the product decisions and hiring process at Kit. We don't function within the same way. So they're very smart about the acquisition. Basically what it boiled down to is I sat down with Toby and we were the number one marketing app at that point in their ecosystem. And uh, we just had a really healthy conversation and realized that we both deeply cared about the same people and that we had a very aligned vision of what the future will look like for e-commerce businesses and entrepreneurship. And we realized that we would definitely accomplish more together than we would apart. It's better to run it, instead of running in parallel, running in the same line uh, behind one another in tangent. And so uh, with, the, with the caveat that he didn't really want me to come and change, he wanted me to come and have endless resources so I can just accelerate. And so I think that in the situation with Shopify and Kit, we had a very clear understanding going into it what the expectations were gonna be like, what the freedom was gonna be like. And if anything, we hope that we positively influence uh, various teams within Shopify to get more lean, right? 
uh, when we got our new office, I was adamant. We were not going to have a fucking ping pong table. Like every office, people are there playing games. Everyone on my team makes a lot of money. Like if you want a ping pong table, put one in your house, right? Like that is our philosophy. So I, I think that, you know, we at some point have to be the new blueprint for them. We have to remind them what Scrappy looks like. We have to remind them that it's embarrassing to be in a product where you have a tiny team that's just moving like a locomotion. And then you get everyone on board with moving fast and moving lean. So that, that's my personal mission uh, as one of the directors of Product at Shopify now, is how do we force everyone to be uncomfortable? How do we force everyone to move fast? Just because you're in first place now doesn't mean you're first place forever. Shopify is destroying everybody, but there was a time where Blackberry was destroying everyone too. Like I'm not in it for second place. That's why we got the wall. So. All right, we have time for one more question if anyone has a brief question. No? No? All right, perfect. Oh, well, thank you, everybody. All right, Hope you thank have a great you. Day.